Hello everybody and welcome to this next part where we're going to be talking about techniques to assess endothelial function. Now note the, the, the change in the term from endothelial dysfunction to function. When we're actually assessing the health of the, the arteries, then we're looking at the function and obviously if we find impairments that will then indicate endothelial dysfunction. If there was no impairments then we are just literally examining endothelial function. Now the best way to measure endothelial function uh, is in the coronary circulation because that's where you get most of the um, uh, symptoms of um a narrowing of the blood vessels of the coronary arteries uh, and in that case you would do a coron coronary angiogram which is basically inserting a dye into the coronary vessels through a catheter and using an angiogram which is like an x-ray to image the movement of that dye and in areas where the coronary artery is stenosed you'll obviously get a reduction uh, in, in the movement of that dye and you can work out the percentage narrowing. Now the problem with coronary angiography is it's a fantastic technique, it's used clinically by cardiologists cardiologists to diagnose um, many patients that are suspected of coronary artery disease but for a research perspective and from a repeatability point of view it's not a technique that you can do every single day so in a patient that needs a coronary angiogram yes it's the gold standard uh, but as, as scientists we actually want to study some of the biological mechanisms of disease we wouldn't be able to do a coronary angiogram on, on an in individual on a regular basis because it's time consuming it's invasive uh, it involves risk to the participant or to the patient uh, and obviously it needs uh, the a very specific expertise as well now there are several assessments we can do in our peripheral circulation which are highly correlated with assessments of uh, the coronary circulation okay so we do what what scientists normally do uh, and also people working in vascular labs to diagnose various different uh, um, uh, cardiovascular diseases they use what what is known as non-invasive non non sorry i'm getting spelling that wrong okay non invasive assessments of vascular health okay so you've got several assessment non-invasive assessments of vascular health which as I said are correlated with coronary angiography okay so you can do these uh, assessments uh, of non-invasive vascular health um, in the peripheral circulation so if I draw out <coughs> a blood vessel again We'll have a look and uh, see if so I'm going to just draw the endothelium on both sides. Now there's several techniques in the peripheral circulation which also have uh, gold, which are also gold standard techniques for looking at uh, uh, blood flow and the structure of the artery and they relate, as I say, they relate to what's going on in the coronary circulation. Now the first thing that we need to do when we're looking at an artery is we want to be able to see if the artery dilates properly. So we want to look at function. Okay, so we want to look at dilation, which automatically means we must look at the activity of nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide activity or bioavailability cannot be measured directly because nitric oxide has a very short half-life. So we need to create uh, techniques which can stimulate the release of nitric oxide so that we can measure vasodilation. Okay, now amongst the most widely known technique is a technique called flow mediated dilation. Okay, and I'm actually going to, uh, in the next video, show you how this technique is actually performed down in our laboratories. But for the moment, we'll focus on the theory. So essentially what flow mediated dilatation is, is that we put a blood pressure cuff around the arm for five minutes, we inflate it, okay, for five minutes, sorry, so it stops the blood flow going to the hand. At the same time, we're imaging the brachial artery using an ultrasound machine. When we release that blood pressure cuff, there'll be a sudden increase in blood flow through the artery, through the brachial artery, and the force of the blood will exert that shear stress on the endothelial cell, which will release nitric oxide, and you'll get vasodilation, and we can measure and the change in dilation after we release the cuff to the baseline diameter of the artery and we can see the percentage change 
in the diameter of the artery and that can give us a, a quantification of nitric oxide mediated dilation. Okay, so this is a, an, an assessment that's been used in lots of clinical studies uh, for the last 20 to 30 years. It was the, the technique was first introduced by uh, Seller Major and his group in uh, 1992. Uh, so it's been going for a very long time and it's been refined with many technical guidelines over the years as well. So flow mediated dilatation looks at vasodilatation, which is a functional outcome of the vessel. Okay, now there are other assessments as well. So, you know, you can look, you can actually give uh, various different drugs to stimulate the release of nitric oxide. So uh, we'll talk about those just in, in just a moment, uh, but that's, this is a functional measure. Okay, and this is giving us an idea of uh, the early changes within the blood vessel. Okay, so I'm gonna put early. Now, if we were interested in looking at the intermediate stages, okay, we can actually look at a combination of function and structure. And again, one of the most commonly used techniques for this, and I'll use a different colored pen, is something called pulse wave analysis. Okay, now basically every time your left ventricle contracts, it sends blood to all of the, the vessels of your body and it sends a, what's known as a pressure wave to all of the blood vessels in your body. When that pressure wave reaches a branch point, okay, in, your, in, in, in the blood vessel, um, then it will be reflected back to the heart. So that pressure wave which is moving forward reaches a branch point and is reflected back to the heart. Now normally that pressure wave will arrive during diastole and it will allow the coronary blood vessels to fill, but in people that have stiff arteries, okay, so pulse wave analysis tells us about the stiffness of the arteries. So if the arteries are extremely stiff, so they lose the, the, uh, their elastic capabilities, they lose their elastin, elastic membrane, uh, then the artery will be very rigid. It won't be able to expand as blood goes through the blood vessel. It will stay very rigid. And that will mean that that wave will move forward very quickly, will get to branch points and be reflected back to the heart very quickly as well. And it will be reflected back when the heart is still trying to, when the left ventricle is still trying to eject blood to the rest of the body. And so if you can imagine if the left ventricle is trying to get blood out to the body and you've got this pressure wave coming back, then it's gonna make the job of the left ventricle even harder. And so if over time you can get damage to the left ventricle um, and pulse wave analysis is a measure of the, the, the pulse pressure wave and you normally measure it in the radial artery uh, there is another technique called pulse wave velocity, which looks at two arterial sites. So you could look at the carotid uh, and the radial or the carotid and the femoral artery and look at the, the time it takes for the pressure wave to move uh, through those two points. Uh, and then you can, you can actually measure the velocity of that pressure wave in meters per second. So a couple of techniques there, pulse wave analysis and pulse wave uh, velocity. We'll put that here. Okay, so this is looking at the intermediate measures of atherosclerosis or, or dysfunction. Now, if I was to extend this blood vessel a little bit more for a bit of clarity, we can also look at structural measures as well. So we can look at measures which are directly examining the um, advanced but subclinical stages of atherosclerosis. So what we can actually do is use ultrasound to look at carotid intermediate thickness, and I'll use another pen again for that. So carotid, we don't need that here, intermediate thickness. So essentially, again, I'm gonna show you these te techniques in the laboratory uh, in, in, in upcoming videos, but essentially carotid intermediate thickness involves using an ultrasound machine to scan the left and the right carotid arteries. And we're trying to look at the thickness between um, the, the intima, which is here, and the media, which is obviously this section here. So we're trying to look at this very small gap and work out in millimeters, mm, 
what that gap is. Now, in an individual that has uh, atherosclerosis, there's going to be increased thickness between the intermal lining where the endothelial cells are and the media, which is where the smooth muscle cells are. And if that thickness is increased, then that indicates atherosclerosis. Now, carotid intermal media thickness is actually used in vascular labs for the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease and there's cutoffs for men and women and obviously if you're above those cutoffs then it means that you're at a greater risk of cardiovascular disease okay so carotid intermediate media thickness gives us a good indication of the structure of the blood vessel now the other thing that we can do whilst we're scanning the carotid arteries is to look for plaques so in some individuals, particularly those individuals that have diabetes and they've had long-standing high blood pressure and it's not controlled properly, they can get plaques throughout the blood vessel. Okay, so and those plaques contain inflammation, they can, uh, sorry, inflammatory cells, uh, they contain uh, white blood cells, they contain uh, lipid deposits and foam cells as well. Uh, and those plaques can be stable in which case that's fine it means that they've got a cap which is nice and stable it's keeping the contents of the plaque within the plaque or you can have unstable plaques where the cap is very weak and it can rupture and when it ruptures all of the contents inside here can go into this blood vessel or they could go to any part of the circulatory system and cause damage elsewhere so for example you may have uh, a clot in your carotid artery and it may break off and get lodged in the coronary vessels and give you a heart attack or it may get lodged in your uh, the vessels of your uh, lungs and give you a pulmonary embolism so it could go to anywhere and cause a particular uh, clinical uh, emergency clinical consequence of that so th th this is all this could also be measured with uh, carotid ultrasound as well so this is a measure of um, advanced but subclinical so remember earlier I said it's subclinical now all of these measures are looking at the stages of atherosclerosis before you get significant narrowing once you get significant narrowing then you, all, you already have a lot of impairment with function so you have a loss of nitric oxide you, you already have stiff vessels so they don't expand properly and you also get thickness of the intermedia wall and obviously progressing further you start to get significant stenosis or narrowing of the artery so these are all subclinical measures and they give us an idea of early damage to the blood vessel they use very commonly in a research setting to understand the the impact of different interventions so for example if I was going to give somebody uh, an exercise program and I wanted to look at their um, uh, vascular health I wanted to see the effects of the exercise program on vascular health then I would be able to utilize these assessments at baseline start my patient on an exercise training program measure these again say two weeks six weeks 12 weeks later and see what improvements I'm getting in response to the exercise training program and adjust as appropriate and of course you know you could use diet you can use medications or any particular intervention uh, and look at the effects of these vascular measures they do have some kind of caveats so you know they need to be uh, conducted in very controlled settings with lots of factors taken uh, uh, care of otherwise you get results which are not accurate or not reflective of what's going on in the blood vessel so that's extremely important